Appreciate it, Brother Tom. So one of the last things Brother Tom said is something that definitely crosses your mind whenever you think about how to deal with some of this stuff. Ultimately, these are souls that God is concerned about. Uh, what they're doing is filthy. What they're doing is sinful. What they're doing is vile. My friends, I'm utilizing terminology that comes right out of Romans chapter 1. Whenever we say that, so these are not things that we made up, but at the same time, we are definitely concerned about their souls like we are about any souls. And so I want to look at this topic today from a couple of different perspectives, three in particular. Number one, from a societal perspective, what is this thing doing to our society? And, And whether we know it or not, whether we are prepared to admit it or not, this thing has adverse ramifications for our society. And of course, that is biblically substantiated. We go back and we look and I heard a gospel preacher say a number of years ago that if God does not deal with the United States of America, then he's going to have to go back and apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's a good statement. And that's a statement that gives us something to think about. We know our God's not a God of partiality. Uh, we know that he's a God that is fair to all men and will render to all men according to their deeds, Romans 2, verse number 6. And so uh, something for us to think about. We are Americans. We're a part of this society. And what happens here is going to affect us in some shape, form, or fashion. And so that places upon us a, a, it should put a fire in our bones or some motivation for us to want to do something. Also, from a psychological standpoint, we'll look at some statistics and talk about what this thing is doing to people psychologically who have subscribed to it. And then from the third perspective, we want to look at it from a spiritual perspective. What should we be doing as the Lord's church where these things are concerned? So starting off, Historically, when a society puts forth a concentrated effort to turn its back on God, and think about what we say here, a concentrated effort. Sometimes people deliberately intend to turn their backs on God. When they do that, sexual immorality or sexual morality is always among the first of the casualties. And so you go back, you look at any society, any nation, and whenever they have determined to turn their backs on God, usually the first aspect of that society to take a hit is the sexuality. Sexuality goes to seed, if you will, when that happens. You look in the book of Romans chapter 1, and of course we're all familiar with this text. You begin in verse number 18, and of course after Paul has told us that the gospel is God's power to save us, uh, who will believe the Jew first, also for the Greek, then he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He goes on to say, In verse number 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Tells you what happens here. What kind of, what brand of truth suppression is under consideration? Well, when you look at the next three verses, you find out because that which may be known of God is manifest in them because God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things, the Bible says, from him, uh, of him rather, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even its eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, the Bible says, but became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and the four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, listen to the details of this. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served a creature more than the creator, who is eternally blessed forever. Or blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women that changed the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lusts one for another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which is meat. And so that is not an isolated case. That is something that's happened among so many different nations. We see it happening right now in the United States of America. And so I want to want to ask a couple of questions in just a moment to our panelists. In fact, some of these individuals who talk about this have been so bold as to admit that sexual immorality was, in fact, their motivation for turning their backs against God. And so what Paul's describing is men who turned their backs on God, sexual depravity came subsequently. We know sometimes people, because the, the sexual depravity is there, turn their backs on God because there's, they know there's no comp- 
compatibility. There's no harmony between God and sexual immorality. I'll read you one quote, and then I'm going to get into what these guys have to say. This is from Aldous Huxley in a document or a book called Ends and Means. It says, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning and consequently assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. The philosopher who finds no meaning in the world is not concerned exclusively with a problem in pure metaphysics. He is also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to do. There's your key. For myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaningless, in other words, godlessness, was essentially an instrument for the liberation from certain systems of morality. We objected to the moral to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. And so Aldous Huxley was just bold enough to say that we don't have any use for God because God interfered with our sexual freedom. So here's a question, Brother Light. All right, so do atheism and, and the L LGBTQ movement go hand in hand because it advocates uh, because its advocates understand the incompatibility, incompatibility, pardon me, between God and sexual immorality. I'd say that modern Christianity and LGBTQ go hand in hand. Uh, don't th don't narrow this thing down. Uh, homosexuality is not the problem; it is a symptom of a problem. The problem is when a culture leaves God, this will always be the outgrowth. And when you go to, I'd say for all of my life, last 50, 75 years, the mantra of all the religious groups outside the Lord's church is, I just know in my heart, I just feel, I just this. To me, this is true. And that's all this is. It is just the, the ultimate expression of that. Uh, I call it trans-doctrinal religion. And I use that on purpose. If you want to have a conversation with people back home, most folks will relive are against the transgender movement as it is currently being pushed by the woke side of things. And you just ask them, well, so if I put on a dress and say that I'm a woman, that doesn't make me one. No, that's right. That's right. Well, calling yourself a Christian doesn't make you one either unless you're transdoctrinal. With the idea there being whatever I want to be true is somehow true. So certainly atheism, uh, there is no God. Therefore, there are no restrictions. Certainly, certainly this would be a result of that. But it's, there's not necessarily an atheistic aspect to this. We went to Boston three or four years ago this month, and those fag flags were high, flying on every church in that area. You go up and down those streets there in Boston, and Presbyterian churches, and Methodist churches, and all Catholic churches, and I mean just rainbow flag, rainbow flag, rainbow flag, walk inside the cathedral, and there it hangs behind the podium. You know, it's one thing to live in sin. It's another thing to be that blatant with it. And to me, that this in-your-face, and we'll have different aspects of this element as we go forward, of course, but the in-your-face aspect of this on the political wing, there's two different arguments here, there's two different issues. The individual who's struggling with their sexuality, you deal with one way, back to John 4, uh, as far as the woman at the well and how Christ approached her, versus the uh, Pharisees in John 23, to talk, talk about Tommy's lesson, how you came down with a hammer. But this idea, there, there's nothing more offensive to God more in your face, counter truth across the board than a man thumbing his nose at God and acting like a woman. That's where Romans 1 is. There's nothing a man can do that's worse so far as being unnatural at every element than being a practicing homosexual. That's why it's somewhat unique. It's sin like every other sin in one way. But, it, but it, that's why these cultures that really use the word defile, these cultures that really descend into terrible wickedness, this sin is always present. And every good king that came to the throne in Israel started by putting the Sodomite out of the land. Because, again, it is indicative. It is a symbol of a culture that has walked off from God. There's nothing you can imagine that's more symbolic of God can kiss my foot than endorsing and having a pride month in that which God calls an abomination. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's sure add something like to that. If you like it, sure. Romans chapter 1, the close of Romans chapter 1, verse 32. And this goes along with what Michael was saying. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure. They're agging it on. They enjoy. They consent with them. They encourage them. It's like Balak with Balaam. Well, I can't curse them, but we can encourage them. We can incite it. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Now, I agree wholeheartedly again with what Michael said. 
it's good that we're talking about this, especially in the, the situation and circumstances, the society and the culture. We're in a university town. Uh, our young men and young women are dealing with these things. Uh, but again, this is a symptom of the sickness. We need to address the sickness. And the sickness is the denial of God. Atheism and LGBTQ, IGA, HEB, whatever letter you want to add to it, it all goes hand in hand because when you deny God, it opens the door to absolutely everything else. A denial of God denies the Bible in its totality. God said, opens the Bible. To say God is not is to mute God and opens the door to everything. Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. Can anybody tell me what was said about Paul in preaching the gospel throughout the Roman Empire? Acts 17 and verse 6. In Thessalonica, they were run out of town. And what was said? They that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now I have taught and I have preached we need to turn the world upside down, but that's not right. Psalm 15, 1 and 2. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly, have thou considered my servant Job? He is perfect and what? Upright. Paul would say, we didn't turn the world upside down. You're already upside down. We're trying to set you back on your feet. And so to remove God just opens the door to everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. Before Brother 1A responds, I should have done this before. I want to introduce our panelists for you guys who might not know. Most of you guys know these gentlemen, but this is Michael Light. Brother Michael Light is an elder and also a preacher in Bangs, congregation in Bangs, Texas. He's also one of our instructors here at the Texas School of Preaching. Brother Ronnie Scherfus is an elder and a preacher over at Butical. I think I... I just preacher, okay, so he used to be an elder, so yeah, so he's just preacher now at, at Butical, also an instructor at the Southwest School of Preaching, uh, Brother Mornay preaches at the Riverside Congregation in Atlanta, Georgia, he will be coming here very shortly to be one of our full-time instructors at the Texas School of Preaching, uh, appreciate you guys, what you have to say, Brother Mornay. <clears throat> just to add some things to what the gentleman already said, I think there are three categories that we can divide the problem or the origin of the problem into. Number one is the atheism because uh, as Romans clearly states, once they left God, rejected God, essentially waved their fist in the face of God, then uh, it was idolatry, it was homosexuality, immora rank immorality. But then also there are some other factors that I think we have to consider uh, of a more practical nature that it has had an effect on what we see in our society today, and that is uh, feminism. And what feminism has done to our society and what it has promoted uh, in our society. What we have is uh, individuals in our society who are effeminate, young men who are effeminate. And uh, when we look at that and we look at the scriptures, we find in, in uh, 1 Corinthians that problem existed back then. Right? We had catamites. We had individuals, young boys who were effeminate, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6 and verse 9 talks about the effeminate. These were, by definition, having the qualities of the female sex, soft and delicate to an unnamely degree, tender, womanish. And so we know that problem existed, but what makes that problem heightened today is that there was a movement that was very diligent and very zealous in promoting this unnatural, and underscore unnatural, type of womanhood, where women left femininity and became masculine, right? And so that was the mindset. The women want to be in charge. They want to do what the man uh, has, has been called to do by God. And so here's a quote I want to read uh, in relation to that. Controlling women tend to attract passive men, and controlling mothers and passive fathers breed passive boys who often grow up with identity problems, problems and questions about their masculinity. So when we're looking at the problem, we're, we're seeing, first of all, the atheism, and then I would add into that the postmodernism, because there are re religious individuals who, who believe that God approves of this. That's, that's the postmodern idea. But then we have individuals who have been influenced by society and influenced by the trends in society, and especially this problem where you have moms in the home that are in charge for all intents and purposes. 
And I, I guarantee you, when you look in the home and you see an overbearing or you see a woman who is taking charge and she is sitting on top of the husband's head, contrary to the Bible, I guarantee you, one or some of their sons are going to be offended. And they're going to be, that's just the way it turns out, psychologically speaking, because the son who is supposed to look to the father uh, for, for influence of who he is, looks to the dominant character. Mm -hmm. And the dominant character is the mother. And so what he does is he adopts the character traits of the mother. That's not original with me. That's in a, a, a book. I forgot the author. It's called King Me, the How to Raise Godly Sons. But talking about the psychology of that. And so I think it's fair to say that there's atheism, the, uh, the postmodernism, but then also practically we're, we're, we're dealing with a deviation from the pattern that God has set and the fallout of that. Absolutely. Most, most definitely the case. Something, uh, Brother Michael, that you mentioned a moment ago, you said you were on a trip and you saw these various denominations with these, these flags flying, honoring this nonsense. And so that, that brings me to the next question. You know, some of our own brethren, and, and of course, you guys that know me know that and my concern primarily is with the Lord's church, man. I, I care about the Lord's body. I care about the family of Christ. And sometimes you're going to see the world do what the world does. I tell that to my wife all the time. And the world's going to do what the world's going to do. The church should look different. should look different in the world. And, of course, that's Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, which probably all of us here can quote. By the mercy of God, I beseech you that you uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, holy, consecrated, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed through the renewing of your mind. So some of our brethren have shown a propensity toward falling in love with all things denominational. We know what we're talking about. We got brethren that are in love with denominationalism. Denominations such as Presbyterian Church USA, more recently the Methodist Church, and even the Roman Catholic Church leaders have voiced support of the LGBTQ perversion. And so here's a question. How long before apostate congregations begin to express open advocacy of this sexual perversion and what should be the response of the faithful? Well, it's already happened. Uh, and you almost have to begin to rethink how you even word this. So that's why I kind of you know, pushed the atheist part aside a moment ago. You're either faithful or you're not faithful. Man without God's in trouble. You, you cannot guess your way to good morals. You don't get lucky when it comes to living right. You're either following the truth or you're not. So if Church of Christ or not, as far as what's over the church building, if you cease to follow the truth, you're going to be in trouble. About a year ago now, several months ago at least, uh, in fact, I may have sent this to some of our the guys that we discussed these things with uh, during the year, uh, Christian Chronicle, six, eight, ten months ago. There's a big article, a multiple-page article in the paper uh, about... Skillman Avenue Church of Christ in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and they were about to give their property, or considering giving their property, to North Richland Hills, which is also in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, where Rich Ash has been, radical liberal church. I mean, they were liberal before liberalism even had a name, I mean, way back, kind of Max Licato type stuff, way out there. And in this article, what shocked me, Skillman for years had been, reputation-wise, a pretty good congregation, though they've been in trouble for the last 15 years as well. They were going to give this property over $10 million in assets, by the way, to North Richland Hills. But they were tapping the brakes because North Richland Hills does not have, to their credit, female elders. And they are not, according to Skillman Avenue's search group, they're not LGBTQ affirming enough. In other words, North Richland Hills is way too conservative. For, seriously, <laughs> for Skillman Avenue to give their building to. And that's what this does. But this goes back to many implication. 20 years ago, 25, every lectureship, we spent hours, every lesson. I got so tired of hearing guys quote John, I mean, Colossians 3, 17. I was like, guys, preach something else. Well, those old guys knew what they were talking about. Because when you misunderstand the authority principle, everything else can happen. So all of this has been coming for years by implication. If I can disregard these things, I, I redefine what love is. I redefine what grace is. I stress don't condemn, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge, to where basically anything goes, then when everything starts going, don't be surprised. And that's kind of the path we've gone down. So, so yes, a, as, we, as we walk away from, thus saith the Lord, on any positions, in this case, this particular position, it's going to be more and more commonplace to hear the same things coming from brethren. And then when you have preachers who seem, not just seem, they are infatuated 
with denominational writers and denominational scholarship, then you're going to hear denominational sermons. That's what they're going to preach. You preach what you know, and that's what they know. That's exactly right. And before you weigh in, Brother Sherfus, so this goes hand in hand with what we were dealing with on yesterday. So it's nice uh, kind of progression of, of our panels. But yesterday we talked about postmodernism and what you were saying, Brother Light, are just some of the key tenets of postmodernism. You know, don't judge, everything goes on all these types of things. And so when you look at any type of false system, false philosophy, man, these things are going to naturally flow into the bigger and better, bigger and greater problems. And, and, and besides just the atheism in and of itself, yeah, postmodernism has got a lot to do with, with the climate that we see morally in our country today. You know, one more thing that ties back to that quote you had earlier. It doesn't matter why, okay? Sometimes we get to analyzing why they did this, why right. they went that way. This sounds very simplistic, but it's true. It's never right to do wrong. And, when, and, and, I, and I find this very uh, distasteful, and I jump it every time I hear it in my, my presence. When someone says, well, I kind of think, uh, stop. Don't even entertain the idea that there's any justification at all for what they did. Because when you begin to express, uh, well, I can understand where they're coming from. No, no, stop. Because mm -hmm. what you're saying is maybe God's a little wrong on that situation. Maybe that situation is just a little bit different than what this text applies to. And I think somebody inadvertently trying to be compassionate, we wind up endorsing, at least tacitly, mm -hmm. the false position. They, get, they, they leave thinking, well, maybe in some circumstances it's okay. And then, of course, the way we are. My circumstances are always more special than yours, at least to me. Therefore, I give myself permission, and we just keep going. Yes, sir. But sure, if it's good, go ahead and weigh in on that. But think about this question, too, that gives this some thought after you get finished with this one. But it was recently noted that American veterans receive one day per year in commemoration in America while the sexually perverse are honored and receive a month of recognition. Has America turned its back on God for sexual immorality, and are there any evidences based on biblical models of God's displeasure with this country. Okay. <laughs> with, with, with regards to what do we do in, a, in the first question. Acts chapter 15, uh, the issue was in the church. What did they do? Mm -hmm. They debated it. Uh, they opposed the error. They stood for the truth. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Well, why? Verse 14. Uh, when I saw they walk not uprightly. Uh, when, we, when we're talking about an effect on the Lord's church, we have to stand for the truth. We have to oppose it. We have to deal with it. Uh, it's when they're not walking uprightly. You know, if I were to get a, uh, a splinter in my hand and let it go, it could turn into enough of an infection to cost me my life. And if we allow infection to enter into the body of Christ, it will destroy the church locally. Yes, uh, so we deal with it. Will it happen? Absolutely it will happen. Look at every one of the churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. You study the city of Ephesus. You study the city of Smyrna, Laodicea. The churches took on the culture and society in which they were because the people came into the church out of the world, out of those societies. It is for shepherds and it is for gospel preachers to preach the truth. Now, that being said, look at Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to note something here in Ephesians chapter 4. This is what we are to do as preachers. Verse 17, Paul said, This I say, therefore, after speaking concerning the church and the unity of the church, he said, Do not walk as other Gentiles walk. But I want to get to verse 19. And he, he emphasizes what the Gentiles were like, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness. How? Greediness. With greediness. We know what it is to be greedy. They couldn't get enough of it. They wanted more. But now, look at verse 20. But you have, he knew, who's he talking to? He's talking to the church. You have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and been taught of him as the truth is in Jesus. That's what we are to do. I keep going back to that. They did not turn the world upside down. That was the pagan view. They were turning the world right side up. How did they do that? They were preaching Jesus. What does Paul say in Ephesians? We continue to preach Jesus. That's how we deal with that. Is there any example, again, of uh, a parallel? Uh, well, Jude verse 7. Uh, doesn't Sodom and Gomorrah stand 
as an example uh, for man today, for those that turn their back. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 2, the ox knoweth his owner, the ass his his master's crib. But what about the people? They do not know me. They do not consider. What was the end result of those things? Um, The book of Hosea chapter 1, and this is absolutely stunning. Hosea chapter 1, verse 4, the first child, name him Jezreel. There's vengeance coming. Your second child, name her Loruhama. My mercy is about to an end. But the last child, what was the last son's name? The third, the second, third child, second son, Loami, which meant not my people. Could you imagine naming your son Loami? And they say, I want to introduce you to my son. What's his name? Not mine. <laughs> Uh, There are examples, Mm -hmm. and the end result Mm -hmm. is judgment. So, Brother Mornay. As far as the result, uh, as far as the response, rather, of the body of Christ, I think we got to preach the word. Who in here does not believe that baptism is essential for salvation? Right? We all believe that. Why is it that we all believe that? We, we've heard that preached multiple times. I extend the invitation every sermon. We extend it. We talk about that every single time. We, we know it. We believe it because it's preached, and it's preached boldly from the pulpit. I think the problem in the body of Christ, generally speaking, is that there is not enough preaching on the matter, and there is not enough bold preaching on it. People or preachers, rather, I should say, hem-haw about the subject. Uh, they hem-haw about the home what the roles in the home are. Mm-hmm. We're afraid to say what the husband's role is and what the woman's role is because we don't want to offend uh, the ladies in the congregation. Uh, you should be more afraid about offending God, right? Yeah. We should be preaching boldly uh, in the congregations. And uh, as was said, there's going to be issues, but I think generally speaking, uh, if we start preaching boldly, if we start uh, preaching often on these topics, if we strengthen our pulpits, uh, this problem, uh, this problem is going to be less likely in 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 the brotherhood in in our congregation. So I think that's that's where we start. When the apostle Paul is talking to various congregations, he's writing to them, he's rebuking them. If it happens in the congregation, preach it. If you lose your job, call one of us. We'll see where you can find something else. You work for God anyway. You know that's the mindset we have to have. If they don't want to listen, dust off your clothes and go to another congregation. But preach the truth. And preach it fervently. As far as this country is concerned, we have to understand as when God talked to Abraham and he talked about the Amorites in Genesis chapter 15, and he says, Not time for you to go over there yet. Why? Because their iniquity is not yet full. But when the Israelites are marching into Canaan and taking it over, that's not them plundering, that's God's judgment, right? They had their time, just like uh, Nineveh was given their time. And, and God even gave them more grace. God sent Jonah and gave them an extra uh, a number of days for them to get themselves right. I, I do believe when we look at, at those models in the Bible, you know, America's time is coming. You, you can set your clock, but America's time is coming. God is not going to allow this to continue. God's not going to allow you to wave your fist in his face continually to murder children and to promote these abominations and just sit back as if he can't do anything. Our time is coming, and uh, we, we, uh, I don't know if we can save it, uh, but I, what I tell the brethren all the time is, uh, save as many as you can. Save as many as you can. Yes, sir. So let's, let's move into the psychological aspect of all of this. This thing has a profound psychological uh, ramification. And so instigated gender dysphoria, and the reason why I say instigated gender dysphoria is because a child does not become discontent with whether or not they're a boy or a girl unless they've got some type of outside influence, some type of external factor that is encouraging that. And so when it comes to this, for so many years they try to say, well, people are born this way. No, they're not. No, they're not. It's, it's not nature. It's nurture is what is causing gender dysphoria. And so... Instigated gender dysphoria comes at a heavy price. Studies show that between 37 and 74 percent of people who have gender dysphoria suffer suicidal ideation. In other words, having a propensity or at least thoughts of suicide. A high profile case recently involved Bruce, so-called Caitlyn Jenner, 
And so you remember all of the big hoopla about Bruce Jenner used to be kind of a, a poster child of a manly man back when he was competing in the Olympics, decided he's going to become a woman. I think that that was just him not being in the spotlight for so long and, and finding the most convenient way to get back into the spotlight. But, but at any rate, he decides he's going to have the change, you know, mutilate his body, call himself Caitlyn Jenner. And he does all that. All of that came with a lot of fanfare. And you know, all these liberal outlets were celebrating what he was doing. The very next thing that you read after all of that is done is that he's now thinking about taking his own life. And so that's a very, very real. And then he's since gotten over it, I guess. He even tried to run for the governor of California or something not long ago. But that was the first thing that you read after he had had this surgery mutilating his body was that he was contemplating suicide. And so it's a very real, real thing. Here's a question. Should our care for the souls of these neighbors warrant a stronger involvement from the church? I want to, first, I want to self-edit. I made a comment earlier, kind of a, uh, what I call a common phrase on that flag, which probably wasn't very appropriate, especially in a conversation where we're trying to handle helping people find their way instead of the way out of situations. And uh, some of us may have grew up a little older, older guys that heard, you know, terms were used. They may not necessarily be bad words, but we're trying good, better, best, trying to get through the message. So we don't want to be, a, we don't want to hinder ourselves on any of these topics, any topic, by throwing an artificial barrier up that now we got to get through that. So that was poorly said, uh, and is, I guess, stands as an example how not to do something. Now, coming back to this, Bruce Jenner, that's the first athletic hero I had. I'm older than Terrence, not much, but some. 1976, guys, he was the uh, decathlon champion and the first American, or the first athlete on the, po on the front cover of the Wheaties box, man. I mean, Bruce Jenner was a stud. He was the guy. <laughs> he's still a guy, but he's, uh, he's <laughs> but, but he's changed his approach somewhat. But this, but, but this, I want you to, from one standpoint, this issue is no different than any other sin from this standpoint. When I talk to a Baptist, they're just as messed up. Not, not in the physical sexual components, but their mind, their doctrines, their, their way of looking at life. The, the Catholic is just as twisted. The, the humanist is just as twisted. So far as misunderstanding what life's about, the purpose, where we came from, what it's for, what gives us a good life, all of those things. But gender dysphoria has long been a terrible mental disorder. It is a very yes. debilitating disease. Uh, and people, they get so, their self-image and their body image is so confused. This is a big deal coming forward. Not, not just the sexual component. But body, uh, body image surgeries, adding all manner of technology to your body, horns, spinning your tongue, tattoos. You, you see a lot of these tattoos. The, the ego of the skin itself is not the issue. The, psycho the psychology that's driving it is a big problem. Matt Walsh had a discussion just a few weeks ago on the lingering physical problems of these, trans these surgeries. When you invert the male penis, you don't actually get a vagina. You have an inverted male penis. And that thing grows hair on the inside. And it also will close up. You have to put spacers. There are procedures that you have to go through, hair removal procedures with great regularity. This is an ongoing mental, physical, psychological, chemical dependent. This is a problem. Way more than just, it's not just instantaneously, wham, we'll just fix your Terrence up there, and all of a sudden he becomes this beautiful black lady. That's not how this works. <laughs> It's not. And again, I, I know it's funny, but it's not funny, okay? So we're trying to get to this where it really is. These people have a problem, and you do not do them a service by allowing them to keep lying to themselves. Uh, I was at a, a, a visitation for a friend of ours that died just the other day, and a coming friend of ours was a Baptist. He said something like, well, we're all going to go. We're all going to the same place. I said, well, no, we're not. I mean, just set it to it because you can't let that stuff stand. So we have to now we have to prepare ourselves and study and think these things through. And you know human nature. So do, do, do you feel sorry for them? Yes, I do. I know a few schizophrenics. I know a few people who are, who are severely have severe depression. It's a very sad condition. Addicts, you need to develop a mentality of how to work with them and help them. How about the church? You are the church. I am the church. You're in school with these people. You're at work with these people. We walk in with these people. You're the the, the uh, JB's restaurant and A and M. Last time I was here, guy comes up. Have to be a black guy as well, by the way. Had on these colored contacts, long hair, fingernails like that, trying to talk higher than my wife. You have to do something to communicate, make some communication, especially if you're in there very often, try to find some way perhaps to talk to them and, and, and wind up in a study. I've actually counseled seven or eight homosexuals, more men than women, over the years. And it's very insightful. You'll learn a lot, by the way, by going through that. 
But you've also got to prepare for that. So yes, the more it is pushed, the other issue becomes where you have confused teens and younger kids, and that's pretty much all of us at one time. You think you weren't confused? You think peer pressure didn't matter? Go back and get your annuals out and look at what you wore. Have you ever seen those the big hairdos and the platform shoes and the and the plaid clothes and the afros and the whatever it was? Peer pressure, right? But if peer pressure is pushing you on these gender issues, that would have never crossed our mind, it's still real. And we need to be a source of support from the other side. The truth is Brother Monet pointed out. Uh, teaching it, being consistent with it, and, and, and try to ask these probing questions, present this information. Again, not making fun of people, not even belittling people, especially on the one-on-one situation. We're trying to get through to them, listen, God loves you and we do too, but this has to be addressed. Just like I would with the guy who's cheating on his wife or whatever. It's got to stop. One way or the other. I think the sense of the question is, should we give more emphasis? How does it read that question? Again? So the question is, should our care for the souls of these neighbors warrant a stronger involvement from the church? Okay. But our care for their soul, this is how that comes across to me. And it might not be how it, it, it is necessarily worded. Should our care for their souls be greater than the care for the souls of any other no our care for their souls should be the same as the care for the souls of all men for God so loved uh, greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost uh, behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of the gods we are motivated certainly because of a love for the souls of man. But I want to give another way to look at it. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, even the head which is Christ. Speaking the truth in love. I've been taught multiple occasions, speaking the truth in love of the truth is the idea there. Not That's not our attitude of how we present the truth to those who are lost but rather it's the motivation of and I, I tried to wrap my head around that explanation now in the context let's put it in a context Paul is not even talking about speaking the truth of those outside of Christ he's talking about speaking to the body that whole chapter is about speaking to the body look at verse what is it verse 25 uh, wherefore putting away lying let every man speak truth to his neighbor Who's your neighbor? For we are all members one of another. We're not members one of another with the world. That context is talking about speaking the truth to brethren. But now, here's how I would give an explanation of this, and I have, I'm, I'll have i make a point, and then I'll pass the microphone on. I'd like to take time to tell you about Freddie Sherpa. Not my son, Fred, but my daddy. And tell you the devoted husband he was to my mom, and still is, and devoted father, and how he sacrificed his time after he had... I had worked all day, how he gave up things for me and for my sister, uh, how he raised us up in a Christian home, how he disciplined us when we needed to be disciplined, how he commended us when we should be commended. And I would want to tell you about him so that you could have the same affection for him that I have for him. But I do not feel obligated to do that. I would tell you about my father because I love my father. We not only should want to speak the truth out of love for the lost souls of men, but because of our love for the truth of our Heavenly Father who has made known Himself to us through that truth. And we should put the same emphasis on all lost humanity. Amen. Brother Mornay, we've got about five minutes here and want to kind of really get down, the, get down to the get down with some of this stuff. So here's what I want you to do. Just discuss our responsibilities as Christians concerning establishments. We've all heard in the news here recently, boycotts against Target a few years ago against Home Depot, uh, boycotts against Budweiser. Hopefully you weren't partaking of that anyway, <clears throat> but boycotts against <laughs> some of these different people. Discuss our responsibility as Christians concerning establishments such as Disney, which was mentioned earlier today, Starbucks, Home Depot, Target, that openly and conspicuously flaunt advocacy of the sexual perversion that the LGBTQ movement represents. I appreciate that. Uh, 
this is a, I guess it's a hot topic because I think a lot of people have different views on this, but I think there's two things really that, that, that should be considered. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I think, is pertinent here where the Apostle Paul talked about not uh, altogether with the fornicators of this world, for then he must needs go out of the world. There is a point to where we have to recognize we are in this world and we have to deal with individuals in this world. We deal with sinners of all uh, faces and, and, and creeds and whatever the case may be, right? We have to understand that. I think that should be foundational. But at the same time, I think it behooves us in these situations to go, you know, this is not just me going to uh, the Dollar General or something that also sells whatever the case may be that is contrary to God, right? This is not just that. This is a company that is intent on pushing this ideology, and they are making it known that this is what they are doing. I think there's a difference there. I think we need to be circumspect about that difference instead of tr throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because when we do that, if we do say wholesale, we cannot fill in the blank. Uh, this store cannot, you know, we cannot do this or do that with, with these stores or businesses. Then are we ready to take that all the way, right? Are we ready then to uh, make the argument or to have that argument and say, well, if I can't do it with them, is there, uh, why is this sin particular or specific? Uh, you know, are there other sins? And we have to go down that road. If we, if we can't establish the soundness of that doctrine at the very beginning uh, and, and take it all the way through, then obviously it's not going to stand. So I, I, I would say 1 Corinthians chapter 5 would be the foundation, but at the same time, I would caution and say, there comes a time when we just have to say, no, you know what, I'm not going to do that because there is a specific emphasis now on these things. Yeah, and that's, that's why I mentioned companies like Disney. I forget the statistic that whoever was preaching earlier this morning mentioned about like Disney. He said that they are devoted to so a, a percentage of their staff on the grounds being homosexual and they're, they're committed to every last one of their productions having something that promotes that. I'm going to quote the great philosopher Shrek. <laughs> you know the discussion about onions and layers? This thing is layered, like he said. To, when, when President Obama came to office, they did the rainbow you know, Easter egg hunt. They put the lights all over. And from 2008 then forward, we have had from the government, I mean, are we going to pay our taxes? Because they're pushing the transgender stuff. I mean, we had uh, Biden right out of the gate. Historic, 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 right? I'm not saying no. This is what like Brother Monet said. This thing is very, very deep in, in its roots. You've got companies. Back to this dysphoria. There was a mother, this case was just last week, pushing this case way into the court system about having her 18-month-old baby girl surgically altered to a boy because she was playing with the tools. I could just tell she wants to be a boy. And that stuff's in the legal system, right? So you not only have the person who's struggling with their own sexuality, You've got a parent here. She's the mental case here. The baby knows nothing. Right. And they can't even walk hardly at that stage, right? So this thing is multifaceted, very, very deep. It warrants our attention. You do have, as you said, the, some of these companies that are pushing it, you know, intently. But we have a culture that wants to see it, the television. I wish, you mentioned the one month a year. I wish it was just one month. It's every single commercial break, isn't it? Right. It's all day, every day. So it, it, it just, and I think that's by design, too. It just wears you down. Well, do not grow weary in well-doing. That's the Christian's obligation. Absolutely. Appreciate you guys so very much. Appreciate uh, all your keen insight. Our time is up, and so we'll uh, hand it over to Brother Tom.